Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar titled the Massachusetts Personnel Record Statute, Employer Obligations, Rights and Risks. All participants are in listen only mode. You're encouraged to submit questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature in WebEx. If your question is not answered during the program, our presenters will follow up with you in the days ahead. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees following the presentation. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Anthony Califano. Anthony, you may begin. Thank you very much. Hello, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us today regarding our webinar on the Massachusetts Personnel Records Statute and uh, a recent development uh, regarding it. Uh, we're using a new format today, as you may have noticed, perhaps not a new format, but a new time frame. Rather than a, a, a longer one or one plus hour uh, webinar, we're going to try to do this in, in 30 minutes. We've called it a micro webinar. Uh, I'm not sure or certain that it's possible for two lawyers to complete any speaking task in uh, 30 minutes, but um, we're going to give it our, our best try. So, um, um, so let's go. Next slide, please. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Anthony Califano. I'm a, uh, a partner in the Boston office of Seifarth Shaw in our Labor and Employment Group, and, and uh, also speaking today is my colleague uh, Abigail Abby Skinner, who's an associate in our l and &E group in Boston. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, what we intend to do today, um, we're going to talk about the Massachusetts Personnel Records Statute. and. It's a statute that's been around for a while, but uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with it, um, this, uh, we hope, will serve as a decent refresher uh, about it. And for those who are new to the statute uh, and want to get to know its uh, contours a bit better, we hope to provide that introduction. Our goal is to tell you what the personnel record statute is about, what a personnel record is its definition under the statute, um, how long uh, you need to keep records as required by this statute as opposed to others, uh, when an employee or a former employee can review uh, what's been placed in his or her personnel record, and uh, what happens when an employee wants to rebut something that's in it. We're going to talk about enforcement of the personnel record statute, uh, risks of noncompliance, and, um, and toward the end we'll talk about uh, the potential implications of terminating an employee who submits a rebuttal uh, to a document placed in his or her personnel record um, and is notified about that. So next statute, sorry, next slide rather. Okay, so, so diving in, what is a personnel record? Um, uh, uh, you'll see here we include a site to the statute itself for, for those who like, to, um, who like to read statutory language. But on the next slide, where, where we are here, the statutory language cuts out. I'm sorry, back up, please. My apologies. This um, here is what we have um, as the statutory definition of a personnel record. For those who can't see the slides, I'll tell you that it is a record kept by an employer that identifies an employee to the extent that the record is used or has been used or may affect or be used relative to the employee's qualifications for employment, promotion, transfer, additional compensation, or disciplinary action. Uh, that's a, a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's a very long sentence, as we sometimes see in, in, in statutes. But um, uh, one word in there I would like to emphasize is the word uh, affect. It's a document that affects the employee's qualifications for employment, promotion, transfer, additional comp, and disciplinary action. And the word affect is not sort of, um, it, it's, it's not, further sort of modified by anything like positively or negatively. It would be both, uh, a, a document that either positively or negatively affects the employee in these ways. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, the statute does um, go on after providing that, uh, that, that, I guess, less than perfectly clear definition of personnel record to sort of delineate what, what it means. Um, and, uh, it, and, and it lays out these things that we've placed in the bullets, and it says that all of the following written things uh, to the extent prepared by an employer of 20 or more employees regarding an employee should be included in the personnel record. So, you, you know, th th this is the list of examples of things. Uh, name, address, date of birth, job title, and description, salary, um, or hourly wage, and other compensation paid to the employee, start date, job applications, resumes, other um, uh, employee responses to employment advertisement, performance evaluations, written warnings uh, of substandard performance, other documents related to discipline, uh, probation documents related to probationary periods or waivers signed by employees, and any copies of any termination notices. Um, so it lists these specific things, and these specific things um, are things that under the statute an employer is supposed to include in each employee's personnel record statute. Um, a word about um, hours of work. There's references here to information about an employee's salary or wage and then other compensation. There's not language in this statute that requires an employer to keep in a personnel record information regarding an employee's hours of work. However, I'm not saying that to imply that you don't have to uh, keep such information. There is actually separate legislation that requires an employer to maintain uh, accurate records regarding hours of work and wages paid, um, um, namely under the Massachusetts uh, Wage Act provisions, but that is not specifically covered here. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, next slide, please. So then there's um, a catch-all um, following that list, and that catch-all is any other document related to disciplinary action regarding uh, the employee. Uh, we call this out because I find that this particular language creates some, um, some angst, right? What, what, what does that exactly mean? Any other document relating to disciplinary action regarding an employee? Sometimes employees will ask, does that mean any email or any text message or any Slack communication that has any bearing on, um, on discipline needs to be included in a personnel record? And I, I think that as a practical matter, that's almost uh, impossible for an employer to do, but um, uh, the language is what it is, and I think that it requires an employer to use, uh, to use their judgment. Um, in my experience, I have found that most employers do not put all, uh, uh, any and all sort of written communication, for example, communications between managers regarding an employee's performance or need for discipline in a personnel file. Um, I think that, that doing so would be unwieldy and super difficult to manage. As we'll talk about later, though, each personnel record document that does negatively impact an employee um, and is placed in the personnel record, there is a notice requirement to uh, the impacted employee. So we need to use good judgment about what goes into the personnel record. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see. Okay, so exclusions. The exclusions language is relatively limited. The language in the statute says that what that, that, that certain things do not go um, in, in, into the personnel record, and most uh, notably would be private information about other employees. You do not put in one employee's personnel record information that would be considered confidential by another employee, and I think that some you know, notable examples would be things like um, medical records, um, uh, personal contact information, insurance-related matters, uh, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> we also note here um, documents or information required by other laws. That's not specifically referenced in the statute, but as I mentioned before, um, 
certain information like uh, hours of work information would be things that you would keep not necessarily in a personnel record, but you would store separately, okay? Uh, next slide, please, and, that this, uh, and with, with this, I'll, I'll pass it off to Abby to discuss retention and removal under the personnel record statute. Thanks, Anthony. So, yep, as he said, I'm going to be bringing us into how long you need to maintain the personnel record and when can you remove information. Next slide, please. The section of the statute that pertains to retention of personnel records is another section with language suggesting that it only applies to employees with 20 employers with 20 or more employees. Um, so you can keep that in mind, but that being said, it's best for employers to be cautious and, and abide by this section really regardless of, of your size or how many employees you may have. And with that, the overarching rule is that personnel records must be maintained for three years following termination of employment. Maintenance means that during these three years, employers cannot delete or expunge any information within those records. Uh, you should be mindful, though, that this three year period extends during any legal proceedings. So if an employee and that's current or former employees brings any cause of action against an employer, the employer must retain the personnel record until that action is resolved. So this applies to any administrative or judicial proceeding. So any cases brought through an appropriate court or the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, Office of Affirmative Action, Civil Service Commission, Labor Relations Commission. Uh, so for example, if an employee does bring a lawsuit and four years after their termination, that lawsuit is still ongoing, the employer needs to make sure that they're maintaining that record until that's resolved. And keep in mind that regardless of what this statute requires, personnel records are going to be relevant to any employment case and employers have a duty to retain those records for however long those proceedings last, whether it's a year, 10 years or so on. Um, and again, taking a cautious approach, you should be mindful that other laws might require retention for longer periods. So it's worth considering retaining them for, for longer than three years as well. Next slide, please. When an employee disagrees with information in their personnel record, they will likely want that information removed or corrected. Removal or correction of information is permitted if there's an agreement between the employee and employer. If they cannot come to an agreement, the employee has a right to file a written statement explaining their position. And this statement, known as a rebuttal, becomes a part of the personnel record and it needs to be maintained by the employer. The statute also specifically addresses a situation in which the file is transmitted to a third party. We're not sure how often that happens realistically, other uh, than maybe a merger of a company where records are transmitted to the acquiring party. But regardless, if a personnel record is transmitted to a third party and it still includes the information that the employee disagreed with when they filed that rebuttal, the employers must ensure that that rebuttal is transmitted as well. The statute also provides a remedy for the circumstance in which an employer places information in the personnel record that they know or should have known to be false. And when this happens, the, the statute gives the employee a remedy through a collective bargaining agreement, other personnel procedures, or judicial process. Uh, so through a collective bargaining agreement that would pertain to a situation obviously involving unionized employees when a governing collective bargaining agreement might, might provide a specific avenue for resolution, such as arbitration, and any personnel procedures uh, may provide specific avenues as well. But the most important part of this is that this section gives employees a remedy through judicial process. So they're allowed to bring an action against an employer in court to address false information or knowingly or should have known to be false information. And in using any of these avenues, the remedy available to employees is the correction of the information in the file and expungement of documents containing the false material. So the statute does not provide any type of monetary damages, attorney's fees, or so forth. Next slide. 
Thank you, Abby. And so this, the, the removal part of the statute ties directly to the notice part. Um, when an employer needs to provide notice to an employee of something that goes into the personnel record, that generally is what triggers what Abby was talking about, and that is the discussion of potential removal of a, a personnel record document. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and so next slide, please. So this, um, this actually is one of the newer uh, provisions in the statute from a 2010 amendment. Um, an employer shall notify an employee within 10 days of the employer placing in the employee's personnel record any information to the extent that the information is, has been used, or may be used to negatively affect the employee's qualifications for employment, promotion, transfer, additional compensation, or the possibility that the employee will be subject to disciplinary action. Um, I, I emphasize the, um, the word placing um, uh, by, by underlining it. That's not uh, em emphasis in the statute uh, because I wanted to call that out. It's the placing of a document in a personnel record that triggers this notice requirement. Another thing to point out is that this notice requirement is tied specifically to records placed in the personnel uh, record that negatively affect. You may recall we mentioned before that the definition of personnel file isn't limited to information that either negatively or positively affects, it's just any that affect, and this is tied to those that uh, negatively affect. Um, many view this as the, the, this change in the law as a way um, to, to ensure that employees are not blindsided um, at, at some sort of future date when they see their personnel record or, or um, by, by what's in it, um, and it also serves to keep employers honest and, um, about what what actually goes in the file and when it goes in. Next slide, please. So the requirement is to provide notice to an employee of a negative personnel record that goes into the uh, goes into the personnel record within ten days. Um, uh, that is what um, what 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 triggers the requirement, and then the question becomes, well, well, well what, right? And so we pointed out in, in this slide that it, it, it's not tied to anything formal or anything sort of informal, and this goes back to what I was saying before. I do believe that any, uh, I, I think that the statute is relatively clear that something like, for example, a written warning, uh, a formal written warning or a negative performance evaluation um, would logically trigger this notice requirement. We get questions about, well, what about e emails? Uh, if there's an email that is sent or Slack communication um, that, that negatively has an impact, and that goes back to um, my point before uh, about sort of being judicious and using good judgment about what does and does not go into a personnel record and really the fact that it's probably impossible um, and would be unwieldy to 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 really to share with an employee every communication that might um, say something negative about the employee. Um, also, the, a, a reminder that the requirement, as I as we underlined, is triggered when 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 a document is placed in the personal record. So we need to use judgment there. Next slide. Okay, that I'll pass it back off to Abby to talk about re, um, responses to employee personnel record requests in terms of an employer's obligations. Yep, you can actually go next slide, please. So employees must file a written request for either a copy or a review of their personnel record. In either event, employers have five business days to respond. While we take the position that it would be five days from the employer's receipt of the submission, the statute uh, phrases it as five days after the submission of the request. If an employee requests a copy, you then have five days to provide the copy. If it's a review, the employer has five days to provide the employee an opportunity to review their record at the place of employment and during normal business hours. Uh, generally, employers do not have to allow an employee to review their personnel record on more than two separate occasions in one calendar year. 
Uh, however, the notifi notification and review caused by placing negative information in the personnel record, as Anthony was discussing, does not count as one of the two reviews permitted annually. Next slide, please. And that's uh, back to Anthony. Okay, so um, enforcement. The statute includes specific language uh, of, about um, the Attorney General's authority under the statute. Um, it, it states, whoever violates the provisions of this section shall be punished by a fine of not less than 500, nor more than $2,500. And, um, and it states specifically that the Attorney General um, has authority to enforce this, um, the, enforce uh, the statute. Now, there's case law that there isn't a private right of action for individual damages um, by an employee under the statute itself for failing to provide um, a personnel record within the five business days, um, but um, the Attorney General um, could enforce that through its authority. Um, let's see here. But the statute does have language indicating, as Abby pointed out, that an employee can assert a private action to correct information in the personal record that the employer knew or should have known was false. So that's what would be to expunge um, or correct what's in the personnel file as opposed to what the attorney general do, which would be enforce the provisions regarding um, what um, re regarding sort of compliance with providing um, personnel records to uh, employees upon request. Now, however, there's no language in the statute um, or in case law that I'm aware of that an employee can sue for money damages, attorney's fees, or punitive damages, the other types of damages that we often see in employment-related lawsuits. Um, and, and, and I suspect that that fact is why we don't see lots of claims brought um, by employees current or former related to the statute because the remedies are, are somewhat limited. Um, and that is what brings us directly to um, the court's decision, uh, the, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts decision in uh, Meehan, which came down in December of 2021. Next slide, please. And Abby's gonna give us a brief uh, summary of, of, of the decision. Yeah, so as Anthony said, this came out just a few months ago, and this was really an important decision concerning the statute. Uh, next slide, please. Just to very briefly give you some background, the facts of the complaint, which uh, the court was assuming to be true as at, at this point, it was still at the motion to dismiss stage. It involves an at-will employee who was placed on a performance improvement plan by their employer. As permitted by the statute, he submitted a rebuttal to this placement that would be added to become part of that personnel record. He was then terminated on the same day that he filed that rebuttal. The employee then filed a complaint in, uh, in Massachusetts Superior Court, alleging that he was terminated because he filed the rebuttal and that therefore the termination was a wrongful discharge in violation of public policy. The trial court granted the defendant's motion to dismiss, but the Supreme Judicial Court reversed, and they held that the termination of an employee for filing a rebuttal does constitute wrongful discharge and violation of public policy. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Anthony to explain that decision a little further. Yeah, so thanks, Abby. To break that down a little bit. so. The, the court didn't hold that an employee can bring a lawsuit directly under the personnel record statute. What the SJC did was determine that the personnel record statute sets forth an important right of employees to submit a rebuttal and that that is a legally protected right that warrants an exception to the at-will employment doctrine, allowing an employee to bring a common law private claim for damages associated with wrongful termination, which would come with things like back pay damages. Um, so a little bit more about that. So the public policy exception to the at-will employment doctrine. Um, the Massachusetts courts have recognized limited exceptions to this employment at-will notion, which is that an employer can terminate an employee for any reason 
um, uh, or, or no reason at any time with or without notice. In carving out that exception, the, court has, the courts have noted that that public policy exception should be construed narrowly to avoid converting the at-will rule into a rule that requires employers to have just cause before firing an employee. Now, what are the public policy uh, exceptions? Just um, to sort of remind folks and, and explain where Meehan falls in. There have been uh, historically in Massachusetts four recognized exceptions. The first is, is um, a, a, a termination of an employee for asserting a legally guaranteed right. In our case law, we see examples of that where an employee is terminated allegedly for filing a workers' comp claim. That is one exception to the employment at will doctrine. Um, another is a termination for doing, uh, of an employee for doing what the law requires. Uh, an example often used there is where an employee serves on a jury and thus misses work and then is terminated as a result of it. A third, uh, the, a third exception is a termination in, uh, involving an employee refuses to do what the law forbids. And an example often used there is uh, committing perjury, right, where an employee allegedly is forced or pressured into uh, lying for uh, lying under oath for the benefit of the employer. And the fourth exception is um, in the scenario where there is a termination um, to protect those performing important public deeds, even if the law does uh, not absolutely require the performance of such, de uh, such deeds. And an example there would be, for example, uh, the termination of an employee who cooperates with an ongoing criminal investigation by a law enforcement agency. Now, here, what the SJC did was it didn't create a new exception. It found that terminating an employee who um, submits a rebuttal for submitting the rebuttal um, falls into that first exception for asserting a legally guaranteed right that that is a right guaranteed under the law by the personnel record statute. So the statute itself does not create a right of action for wrongful uh, termination. And the SJ believed that creating a, a common law exception to the employment will doctrine so an employee can assert a claim um, is, <clears throat> is warranted. Now, a word on what the court um, didn't do. Um, so, uh, uh, what the court didn't do is say that there is a just cause requirement for a termination um, a, 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 of an employee. Uh, the court seems to, to, to indicate that employment at will is, is still alive, although the uh, exceptions to the employment at will um, doctrine allowing for private right of action has sort of expanded a little bit. But the court said that an employee, an employer remains free to terminate an employee for any reason or no reason, so long as the employer does not terminate the employee for filing the rebuttal itself. The rebuttal just memorializes the employee's position regarding the issue in dispute, and that would be whether or not the negative um, performance evaluation or discipline was, uh, was warranted. So the SJC gave an example of what would be permissible by an employer. Uh, the SJC said that if an employee had an attendance problem and then was disciplined, say received a written warning or a file written warning for it, and then the employee filed a rebuttal explaining their position as to why that was unfair or unwarranted, um, and then the employee was fired for submitting that rebuttal, that would create um, a, a right of action. Now, um, but the SJC explained that if the absenteeism continued, right, if the employee receives the warning, submits a rebuttal, and nevertheless continues to be absent from work, the employee could be terminated from employment regarding or because of the absenteeism, not because of the rebuttal. This example sort of highlights one of the difficulties, and that's going to be the factual issue about what is the real reason for the termination. Um, and so um, that leaves us with, well, what does an employer actually do? What can it take away? And I think among the more important things that an employer should do is pause. 
if an employee is about to be terminated and that employee, uh, you want to ask yourself, did the employee just submit a rebuttal to a, a, a document that the individual is notified about going into their personnel uh, record? And then if the answer to that question is yes, the question then becomes, well then, what is the real reason for this termination? Is the termination because the individual made a rebuttal or because of some other uh, impermissible conduct? And the, the uh, SJC noted, or I should say, sort of punted on how to deal with that down the road. The SJC said that um, we imagine, expects that uh, employees submitting rebuttals are going to be emotional uh, when they've been disciplined. And the SJC opined that the scenario when an employee submits a rebuttal that is intemperate or contentious, and those are the words the SJC used, that, 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 that alone will not result in a termination. But the SJC left room for the possibility that the way that the employee goes about the rebuttal could result in a termination itself. So it's not that an employee can submit a rebuttal that in, with impunity that says whatever it wants. And in fact, the SJC said that the protection from termination, of course, does not extend to threats of personal violence, abuse, or similarly egregious responses if they are included in the rebuttal. So what is the line between intemperate uh, and abusive or egregious? The court didn't get into that, and I think that we're gonna need to see more um, case law developed on the line in terms of what that is. I see that we are at 1.32. I guess we didn't quite get it done in exactly 30 minutes, but um, but not too bad. <laughs> uh, well, I'll provide the, uh, the, the CLE now, and then um, we'll take a look at some of the questions. If anybody remains on, maybe we can address a couple of them. So the CLE is SS, and that is S as in Sam, uh, 1124. Again, it is SS1124. Um, and um, with that, uh, I thank you folks. Uh, again, if anybody, if we're still live, I'm gonna take a quick look at a couple of the questions that came in and see if we can address them. Uh, does the statute have an exemption for collective bargaining agreements containing grievance and personnel file information? I actually think Abby addressed that one, right? So if an employee wants to uh, uh, rebut what is in the personnel file, um, the, there are procedures for potential removal, um, and one of those procedures involved the invoking of a collective bargaining agreement or simply by agreement of the parties, and then there's the judicial process one. But I believe that if there's a collective bargaining agreement in place that it's, um, it shouldn't be, be referenced. I'm not sure I would refer to it as an exemption though, but, um, but its, um, its use and compliance I think is contemplated. Another question is, if we receive a subpoena for uh, an employee's file, but the majority of the records are collected electronically, w w what do we do? Um, and I think that the statute is silent. Um, uh, it, well, it may not be. I'm not certain that the record is silent on the, for on the form of it, but in my experience, um, uh, the, the fact that, an, uh, that a document is kept electronically, I don't think creates any sort of an exception you still would have an obligation to produce the personnel record, but the form that you produce it in, I, I think is less important. Printing it would be fine, but if the employee is capable of receiving it electronically, I think that that would be okay too. I think that the important part is that it goes out. Um, let's see here. Ah, are investigation summaries required to be in the personnel file if the investigation led to the employee receiving disciplinary action. So we, we received this. I, I have arguments about this with plaintiff's uh, attorneys um, uh, uh, as to whether or not that would be covered. The argument on, on the one hand is that it must be. If it's a document that, res that negatively impacts the individual's uh, employment, um, then it should be by a strict reading of the personnel record. On the other hand, uh, an investigation summary, particularly if we're treating it as confidential or certainly if it's privileged, might not be something that we put in a personnel record in the ordinary course. 
Did the amount, and another question is, did the amount of time to retain records change in recent years? I've always known it to be seven years. Um, the the the, um, the record retention requirement under the personnel record statute, I'm not aware of it changing, but I think Abby or I mentioned before that there are, or, are, are other statutes and legal requirements that impact how long you keep certain records, including records that you would keep in the personnel uh, record or personnel file. And so um, the three-year requirement is simply under the personnel record statute. Longer requirements certainly exist under other laws. Um, I want to be respectful of people's time. We're at um, 1, 135 as I see it. Sorry for not reaching um, some of the additional questions, but uh, we'd certainly be happy to connect with folks to continue, uh, continue our discussion. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, folks, for attending and for our support team. Uh, with that, we'll sign off.